my pleasure, Lindsay, and thank you very much for the invite. Um, we'll go with the share string and everybody hold your breath. And can we all see that okay? Yeah, thank you. All right, great. Uh, I'll kick off then. So hi, hi, everybody. My name is, uh, is Darren, uh, and I'm an epidemiologist and a statistician by training. Um, now, I, I'm not sure uh, if I just got lucky with the 2.30 time slot on an afternoon uh, with a full day of, of online training calls. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I, I, I guess I'll do my best not to put everyone to sleep because traditionally that's just not the right exact slot for the statistics talk. Um, but if it'll help you uh, stay alert and stay focused, um, I, I promise there won't be any math. There's no equations here. Uh, or anything of the sort. Uh, this is more of a talk about how we can relate to each other uh, as people involved in, in clinical trials. Um, so I think the first thing to acknowledge is that my own background, I'm not a statistician by training, I'm an epidemiologist. And so I started my career working in birth cohorts uh, and primarily focused on child nutrition. And I became very interested in statistics, in pr primarily in terms of modeling infant and child growth. And it's one of those things where if you tell people that you like statistics and you're working in medicine and health, um, for sure people will find you and take advantage of that fact uh, almost immediately. And so slowly but surely my career kind of changed from where I was the kind of scientist to directing things uh, to where I was becoming more and more of an applied statistician and then eventually got pulled into working in clinical trials. And one of the things that really stood out to me in terms of working in clinical trials and not that other forms of research don't feature this, but it really does take a, a really well-oiled machine, a real team of people with lots of different expertise to work and do and conduct randomized controlled trials in clinical settings. And, you know, it extends from obviously the clinician, it extends to the patients themselves, the statistician, quality, pharmacy, um, you know, there's always going to be monitoring, there's IT systems become vitally important. And so every member of that team, really, when working in clinical trials, one of the things that stands out to me is the whole thing falls apart uh, if you don't have excellent people in there. And of course, that means the relationships too. And what the, so the relationship I really focus on for this talk for people who are starting to become more engaged in research uh, is really this relationship between the clinician investigator and the statistician. And so this talk is really oriented to just to give my perspective as someone who's worked as a statistician on a team of people working within clinical trials, and maybe just to give a, a not completely unfiltered, but a fairly unfiltered point of view from the things that I've picked up over the years uh, that can help make the relationship between a clinician investigator and a statistician a lot better, which is better for the trial itself. And if we're thinking about first and foremost, what people's responsibilities are, um, those two roles, the clinician investigator and the statistician, really share a responsibility, uh, probably more so than anybody else involved in the trial, which is for the scientific integrity of the trial itself. So there are certainly things that the clinician is responsible for, obviously, that nobody else will be, uh, patient care uh, and, and welfare being at the top of the list. Um, but it's really this area, the scientific integrity of the trial, where the clinician investigator and the statistician both bring uh, vitally important experience and skills in order to ensure um, that the, the research elements of the study, not just the overall conduct of the trial, but the research elements of the study are done to a very, very high standard. Um, and so it's really important uh, for that relationship to work effectively. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the things I like to try to focus on is, is kind of giving my perspective on, on how that might proceed. And at the end of the day, it's not rocket science, right? So a relationship, a professional relationship is like any other one. Um, they tend to be healthy, good relationships tend to be based on mutual respect and trust and appreciation for what the other person is doing. And so I think that's just kind of the starting point for thinking about uh, how do we get good collaboration between clinical investigators? How do you get the most out of a statistician when you're working together on a trial? And really, step one, again, it's not rocket science. It's just about maintaining respect, trust, and the rest of it. And obviously, that has to go in both directions to, to be thoughtful about such things. Now, there are some barriers to that. And some of them are structural, which we'll come to in a minute. 
Um, another one is to consider that, you know, I, I, I don't want to generalize. There are exceptions to absolutely every single thing I'm going to say. Um, but even amongst clinicians, you know, there are kind of stereotypes that we, we usually like to kind of have a laugh about, about this kind of clinician is like this and that kind of clinician is like that. Uh, I find myself teasing the surgeons probably more than anyone else. You might have your own other opinions. Um, and I think in general, uh, I would say, again, with lots of exceptions, um, that the skill sets behind someone who kind of finds himself in, in a clinical role and someone who finds themselves in a statistical role can be very, very different. And kind of one main one is that, you know, that, that I think comes up fair, a fair amount is statisticians tend to be very kind of slow and circumspect and, you know, very unwilling to make definitive statements about anything. Uh, it's not right. You know, I mean, it, our job is, is uncertainty, really, at the end of the day, a statistician's job is to try to convey uncertainty and how that influences decision making. Um, so that's not a surprise. Whereas a clinician, it's not to suggest they aren't circumspect and cautious and whatnot, but they I, they really do need to be trained in order to make decisions. It's very important for clinicians to make decisions, to make them clearly, to make them confidently. Uh, and even wrong decisions made confidently can be of benefit. Um, so there are some cultural differences, I think, that are very worth being aware of uh, if the statistician and the clinician investigator start to butt heads a little bit. Um, but the biggest thing I think that causes problems for relationships between clinician investigators and statisticians is the environment that we tend to work in. Now, I'll say, uh, as I talk about this, I, I did work uh, at the University of Leeds for six years as a lecturer in biostatistics and, and epidemiology, but at that time I wasn't working in clinical trials. And so my academic and trial career has all been based in, in Ireland. I, now, I have a lot of respect and collaboration with trialists in the UK, so I have some understanding, uh, but I just want to say I don't have a perfect understanding. I'll kind of come back to that in just a minute. Um, but the, the, the kind of main environmental issue we're dealing with is that I don't think anybody would doubt that statistical expertise is really important for a clinical trial, just like lots of other different types of expertise. But for people who have worked a little bit in research, um, you might have found yourself puzzling, well, why aren't there a lot more statisticians? If we acknowledge that this expertise is vitally important uh, to the conduct of a trial, to its interpretation, to its design, and we all acknowledge that clinical trials are very important, then why don't we just have statisticians, you know, hanging uh, on every corner waiting to be involved in studies? And I think it's worth thinking about that for just a minute. Um, it's certainly the case that if you work in regulated clinical trials, um, that it's dictated that you will have the involvement of expert statistical advice. Um, so if you look at the you know, major regulators and their guidance for industry uh, and, and, and good clinical practice and things like that, it's always going to be very explicit that you, know, you shouldn't have a trial without uh, an expert statistician uh, you know, involved in, in, in every, essentially every aspect of what that is. And the problem there is that, well, it, just the reality is obviously that a lot of the regulated trials are obviously have commercial sponsors and commercial entities tend to have a fair bit more money uh, than the academic led or the investigator led studies. So we have this whole class of studies that, you know, are not going to be commercially incentivized. They're not going to be commercially sponsored. Um, and you think about two heads up therapies from two different organizations, you know, who are uh, both marketing those two therapies. There's not necessarily a lot of incentive there for a commercial sponsor for that kind of a study, but it's a very important study from a, a public perspective. Um, and so we find ourselves when we're doing investigator led studies, this kind of uh, a lack of resource. And so whereas an industry funded trial is going to have teams of statisticians are going to have access to CROs, statisticians. Uh, IT support and all the rest of it. Uh, the statistics is something, in my experience, that often seems to be much harder to come across in the academic or investigator-led studies. And that's primarily where I work uh, in Ireland is to help to fill that gap to some degree. Um, and so, you know, it's what is it, though, that makes those two things different? If it's the expertise that's absolutely required in terms of regulated trials, um, then, then why isn't it similarly required? in terms of investigator-led studies. And so there are a number of strategies uh, that the people have come up with essentially over the years, maybe not intentionally, but this is how it often tends to work. 
And so let's say that you're doing an investigator-led study and you need some access to uh, statistical advice because you want to do a good job. Um, you have some training behind you, but maybe you recognize that it's not very sufficient or doesn't feel very complete. And so you ask around, you say, well, where can I get someone who's going to help me with my statistics for my clinical trial? And someone might helpfully say, well, you can just go get someone from the statistics department or maths or whatever. Uh, and that is a, a solution that gets proposed over and over and over again. Um, the problem with that is a fundamental misunderstanding, really, I think, of what an academic statistician is versus someone who I would call an applied statistician such as myself. Um, people who choose a career in academic statistics don't typically choose that career because they're necessarily looking forward to working on teams of people to do clinical trials and to do the analysis itself at the end of the study and, and all the rest of it. I mean, many of them do. There's a lot of overlap in these roles for sure. A lot of academic statisticians are also excellent applied statisticians and will be involved in lots of trials. Um, but it's not always the exact same skill set. And so you can have a very hard time sometimes finding an academic st statistician who will step into the breach uh, and make the commitment that's required to work on a clinical trial as well uh, and to not get distracted by something else they're very interested in. Um, because ultimately, they, they do tend to have this very highly methodological focus of an academic statistician might be interested in improving, say, the performance of some estimator by some fraction uh, you know, uh, of an amount. And that to them would be a huge win for their career and all the rest of it. Um, and so there's this great quote it's from Donald Mainland. This was a statistician, a kind of one of the early applied statisticians, I think, working in medical research is how I would describe uh, Mainland. And, and he was pointing out this, you know, this kind of disconnect back in the 50s and 60s, um, using this thing that you'd have people who might be doing experiments on pigs one day and pig iron the next without any kind of real appreciation for the difference in context. And if there's anything about a clinical trial, you know, it's the context really does matter. Trying to do experiments is one thing and to design them to be scientifically rigorous. Trying to then execute that experiment in a working hospital system, for example, uh, or any clinical environment, of course, is a whole different uh, animal, so to speak. So it's not always going to be your solution. Um, and so I often make this kind of joke, you know, that is the applied statistician. Uh, I kind of feel like someone who sits in between uh, say, the the academic statisticians. And so part of my job is to try to understand what it is they're doing uh, and to translate that into how it can actually be applied to benefit the studies that we're doing uh, and to help educate and work with the, the rest of the team so they understand that as well. Uh, and obviously, it's a completely different skill set on the, you know, the interpersonal side of things. So if this is a discussion about relationships and everything else, um, you know, we, you can kind of, I've heard some statisticians characterize themselves, you know, as walking calculators, but you wouldn't let them talk to the doctors. Uh, you know, so I'm the statistician that talks to the doctors. And so there's kind of a, a continuity there. So then uh, what happens next? So you can't find a academic statistician to come in and, and get involved in your study, not in the way that would be satisfying. And so one thing that happens is that, uh, particularly in universities, um, they try to set up consultancy, um, which makes a lot of sense. So at least there's someone there that you can go and you can talk to and you can ask your questions and they will have a wealth of experience. They will have spent you know, a lot of time learning how to have these conversations with clinician investigators and other people. And so they will have developed a lot of that skill set um, that maybe your average academic statistician doesn't have. The only problem with that well, there's a couple of them. And, and I mean, one of them, this comes from one of my favorite quotes about statistics. You know, there are no routine statistical questions, only questionable statistical routines. And essentially, while the toolkit that we use as statisticians, uh, whether you know, to design, to conduct, uh, to analyze, to report trials, you know, is pretty set in some respects. Uh, it, you know, in my experience, I think most people would agree with this. Most experts in any field would agree with this. The, the devil is in the details. It's in the things that change from study to study. And so while you might get some satisfying answers in terms of, you know, how you might set a sample size or something like that, um, from a consultant statistician, the real benefit, again, is about trying to build relationships that are much longer term. If a trial is running over the course of three or four or five years, you know, it's much better situation if you have someone 
uh, who is deeply involved in the trial the whole way through from the statistical point of view. Uh, so again, this is it's a it's it's kind of a band aid in, in a lot of ways. Um, so then, if if that's not satisfying, uh, then what you really would we we really want people to do, I think, in general, is to use the existing clinical trial infrastructure and actually find a trial statistician, someone who works on the study, who will be responsible during the course of the study. And that's essentially my job. And so in Ireland, um, this is all kind of being slowly but surely developed um, by the Health Research Board, which is our major health funder. And so now there are clinical research facilities. Uh, there are different clinical trial networks being developed. Um, there's other kind of support infrastructure in place uh, and growing in Ireland to support exactly this issue. So my entire job exists in order to be an applied statistician, primarily working on trials. And so I'm core funded by the university uh, and the HRB to, to provide that kind of support and collaboration. Now, of course, uh, in the UK, um, this would be an area where you are vastly, vastly ahead of us in terms of this trial infrastructure. Um, and probably the most, uh, you know, the, the greatest example of this in some respects, contemporary example, would just be the pulling off of recovery uh, during COVID, that the infrastructure in the UK was so substantial that you were actually able to get that study off the ground and working and collaborating across so many different active sites. Um, that didn't happen anywhere else. It, I don't even think it came close to happening anywhere else. I might have missed something out there, but um, it really is a testament to uh, the NIHR and its existence. The very existence of a nationalized health system helps with this a lot. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the UK clinical research uh, and the cl clinical trial units scattered across the country, and they would have many statisticians and lots of other people. Um, so those, you know, at least provides you with some option to try to work with trial statisticians uh, on your studies if you can get that kind of support. Um, unfortunately, that is also not always available. So then you, uh, as the clinician investigator, if, if you can't you know, essentially satisfy your needs in one of those ways, uh, I think it's unfortunately what we wind up having to do often is that you just wind up having to do the stats yourself. And, you know, you are intelligent people, you're well-trained, you are motivated, you have excelled at this point, you know, in your careers and professional lives. Uh, and so it's, you know, on that level, it's completely reasonable that you, that you might be able to, you know, to, to, to manage that for on your own. Um, unfortunately, in my experience, and again, this is not uh, to critique or criticize clinician investigators, this is out of pity uh, for clinician investigators. Um, this is often, I think, what the picture of do the stats yourself winds up looking like, um, you know, where you have kind of an unstructured Excel spreadsheet and you're putting data into it. You've been asked to do research. You've been told it's important for your career. Um, you may or may not have protected time. You probably don't, um, which is a real travesty and a real problem that, that we have to address uh, if we're going to take research seriously. But you're putting the, you know, the data into a spreadsheet. Um, you're then picking some statistical test off of one of these uh, obscene uh, decision trees that people like sharing. Um, you're going to, you know, you've got a pirated copy of SPSS that somebody had and, and let you use. And so you mash the buttons that you remember working to produce the numbers that you think you need. And then you wind up putting that all together. And most importantly, if you don't have that protected time, or often even if you do, uh, you wind up doing this, you know, in the wee hours when you haven't just finished some ridiculous long shift uh, of working um, and, and you're just trying to squeeze this in along with everything else. And obviously, clinicians have uh, an important job that has a lot of responsibilities to begin with. Um, so this is not a great model, but it is a model, unfortunately, that gets used in practice uh, entirely too much. And... The reason I like to talk about this environment, because I think it's important pe for people to understand kind of this gap um, and, and this deficit in our research environment where it exists, because it has real consequences. And ultimately, we need to work together, people who are interested in science and using science to inform decision making, we need to work together uh, to try to remedy these deficits. And there's just no way to ignore kind of the result of these deficits anymore. Um, we can start with these kind of, uh, you know, very severe statements from, you know, people who have been editors-in-chief uh, 
of flagship you know medical journals talking about how they no longer uh, trust a lot of the medical research and a lot of those reasons come down to essentially reasons of poor study design misunderstood statistics misunderstood reporting um you know challenges in how we interpret things and you know that's a real those are damning statements coming from people you know frankly who really benefit from this environment uh you know that they're that these are the people who are actually publishing a lot of the stuff that they don't trust anymore uh, so for them to turn essentially the light on themselves uh, i think is pretty telling and of course very closely i mean exactly related to that is we know a lot more now about this topic of research waste um, and so you can go and you can find a whole you know, special series in The Lancet on this, but basically the idea um, that a lot of the research we do in medicine and health is ultimately wasted, either because we're asking questions that don't matter, um, or we're not using appropriate designs and methods to analyze data, or even if we do those things right, we're not getting the publications, uh, you know, making them accessible to people. Uh, or the report itself isn't very useful because it's not poorly constructed and, and, and written and all the rest of it. And so a lot of this, you know, in terms of this research waste story, again, comes down to uh, essentially a lack of statistical expertise uh, in, involved in, in, in medical studies, including clinical trials. Um, and this is an enormous, enormous problem. And every time someone does a review about the quality of published research in a particular area, the story is almost always exactly the same and reflects exactly these problems. And of course, so for people who are getting involved in research um, and, and you know become interested or motivated by this, the, probably the most important paper I think ever written about medical research was called The Scandal of Medical Research. It was by Doug Altman, uh, who published that in the BMJ in 1994. And in that paper, it's like two pages long. And he makes this you know kind of shocking statement, if you think about it. Uh, we need less research, better research and research done for the right reasons. And so if we think about a kind of why this environment exists and more importantly, why it persists, where we have these deficits in data skills and statistical expertise uh, relative to our need to conduct clinical research that supposedly relies on them. Um, you know, Doug Altman and certainly others as well was very quick to point out that our publishing system, our, our system of rewarding people for doing science is not very well aligned to quality. Uh, in, in other words, it's almost entirely driven by quantity. And when we do talk about quality of research, we use very poor metrics and proxies like impact factors and things like that. So obviously, if you are a clinician researcher, um, you're incentivized to do research because it's important for your career progression, uh, in addition to your own personal interests and in trying to improve how we do things through research. Uh, and then your institutions are kind of the same. They benefit from you producing more and more research. And there's very little oversight, really, when we think about it in terms of the quality of that research. And then finally, just, and I'll wrap up this, this sad, sad story, we'll come more into some specific tips, uh, I guess, about working together with statisticians, is we also focus a lot on the statistics in terms of inference. You know, what does this estimate really mean? How should we really interpret it? But there are this whole other aspect of working with data um, that doesn't get nearly enough attention if we are trying to essentially do the stats ourselves. And so we can think about it in terms of kind of a pipeline, you know, where we go from a design that gets turned into raw data through the actual conduct of the study. There's some level of manipulating that data and checking it uh, that needs to be done. That gets translated into analyses and statistical tests and models. That has to get translated into actual results that get reported then those results have to be interpreted, and then everything has to be put into a paper or some other form of communicating it for the research to actually be useful. And I think what's missed is, this was nicely pointed out by a statistician named Roger Peng, is that we put a lot of, a lot of focus on the inference part, um, but all these other parts are just as important. So just like I talked about a trial, that if any one part of the trial doesn't function, any one expertise is it represented, then the trial itself will suffer overall. It's the same thing here. Any mistake in how you work with the data, even before you get to the actual quote unquote statistics part, um, can completely scupper everything, right? And so we have example after example after example. Um, a fairly recent one that's very well known is a paper that made it into JAMA, um, where somewhere in the coding process, they flipped the, the, uh, 
um, the code for which group was the standard of care arm and which was the intervention arm. And that was being done by in Hopkins. And so they have, you know, an excellent, they have multiple actually excellent kind of biostatistics group there. This would have been a very experienced group. And even they were capable of making this mistake, which of course, if you flip the, the labels on the two groups and you're going to get the exact opposite conclusion. And so that made it all the way to, to JAMA before it was eventually uh, identified. And, and again, this isn't to uh, shame or critique. These things can and do happen is the point. Uh, and to their credit, they identified the problem eventually and corrected it. Uh, and, and everything was, was, was sorted from there. But it's just not hard to imagine that if you're doing the stats yourself, so to speak, um, then you know these kind of problems can creep in very, very easily and without you knowing it. Because um, it, it, again, it's a very technical thing. All right, and so then finally, just uh, before we move on to the next section here, um, it's just to reemphasize that what you do as a researcher is important, right? And so it's not just about you know, if we publish a poor study that it doesn't get used or it's not very uh, informative, right? These things can actually lead to patient harm. If we do poorly conducted, poorly designed, poorly analyzed, poorly reported studies, uh, patient harm is a real thing. Um, some of the obvious, you know, harm could be mistakenly suggesting that harmful treatments are beneficial. Uh, that probably doesn't happen too, too often, but it's certainly a possibility. Um, we might waste precious resources on ineffective treatments. That's certainly a much more likely possibility. But I think one that people miss out on often um, is that we might actually delay the discovery of an efficacious treatment. And so what I mean by that is if you don't have a good solid design, a good solid analysis plan um, you know, for the clinical research you're involved in, certainly for clinical trials, that you wind up coming to the end of a study uh, maybe you have a null finding. I never say negative finding, but you have, might have a null finding. Um, but you don't know if that null finding is because there actually wasn't an effect of this treatment or if there were some other problems with the, um, with the, actual, uh, you know, the, the actual design of the study itself. And so then it leaves us at the end of that study not knowing anything new, and maybe we have to do it again, and maybe we wind up finding that there's an effect of that treatment. Um, but then what we've done is we've delayed something that could have benefited patients. Now it's going to take that many more years later before it can actually get to market and help people. So I think this is a very important thing to consider when we're talking about the importance of statistics. Okay, and that is a plea for you. So the people in this room, as you're developing your, 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 your careers in research, uh, you know, is to please remember if you find yourself in these situations where you know, you're not getting the support you think you need, for the, for the integrity of your trial and everything else. Uh, it's important that we all, though, all of us work in clinical research, not you know just accept that that's the way things have always been and there's nothing else that could be done about it. Um, we all have to identify these deficits, whether it's statistics or anything else for that matter. Okay, I'm gonna take a breath here for a second. Um, I'm gonna put my headphones back on because I think they turned off on me. Um, what I'll focus on now is more about the very specific nitty gritty things about working uh, with a statistician uh, on your study. And I mean, one thing I think, I show this picture to people uh, and it seems to speak to everybody, not just statisticians. And really with this, 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 this price list here is something about expertise. And you have expertise and I have expertise. And when you're working in teams, um, you know, it's hard for experts to work with other people who don't share their expertise sometimes. Uh, because sometimes the point here is it's just easier, you know, I just do the, I do my part, I'm the expert, I'm just going to do it. And if you could just stay out of the way and let me handle it, then, you know, we'll all be happy at the end of the day and, 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 and we'll move forward. Um, but that has to go both directions. And, and really the way, the only way to, to achieve that, again, is by building trust over time, building a relationship, working with people together. And, and I heard, I think Lindsay had said on the last talk what I, I, I dipped into, you know, is working with people you get along with and people you can stand to work with is really, really important in, in clinical research. You know, life is too short uh, and there's plenty of jerks out there, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, it's important to try to avoid them as much as you can. And so if you can find ways to work with a statistician and develop that trust and whatnot, um, I think that's, you know, ultimately what, what you're really aiming for. 
All right, but that again, that's not always possible. So let's talk about some of the common scenarios that came that come up. And so one of the most common ones, and again, this isn't, you know, again, this isn't a critique of you uh, as clinician researchers or investigators. This is that environment um, that constantly, you know, uh, we get requests that I've got an abstract to, I've got a grant to, I've got to give a talk, and I need this tomorrow. I need this in two days. And, and of course, to be on the other end of that, right, if, if you imagine what I'm doing in my day to day, um, you know, at any given time, I'm probably involved in somewhere between 10 and 15 studies. All of them will have different outputs, deadlines. They'll all be at different stages. And that's in addition to kind of the academic parts of my work where I'm teaching and doing all of those things. So in other words, I'll just to say that we're all very busy people. And it's no more realistic to come to a statistician and say, I need this in three days than it is for me to do the same thing to you or really anybody else. Um, and so... But there, but sometimes it can't be avoided, and, and you know, so we do try to press on in, in the, you know, in, in the need to develop relationships and trust and and all the rest of it. You know, it's important to try to accommodate this as well. As well, and so one of the most important things you can do before you have this conversation um, with a statistician, particularly if it's the first time you've been working with someone, is they're always going to come back to you, and you're going to hear this over and over and over again in your career. What is the research question, right? And everybody here have been told this before. Um, but I think we can be a little bit more specific. And, and if I, I'm thinking about research questions in terms of, from a, from a point of view as a statistician, I can pretty much classify just about anything I think that a clinician might want to do in three different ways. Um, we either want to describe, right? So we want to take some data and we want to describe what's going on because this helps us identify and evidence problems as they exist. And so that is in and of itself a valuable thing. Unfortunately, in the research kind of ecosystem and reward system, this is the bit of research that isn't uh, essentially respected uh, the most. It, it, it's disrespected. Uh, people really kind of too often frown down on the novelty or importance of description when really everything starts with description and measurement. Um, so then the next thing, though, is that a lot of problems come down to just prediction. And so if we're thinking about diagnosis, we're thinking about prognosis, risk calculators, and things of, of that nature. So this is a, a, you know, these are questions where, you know, we don't have to understand every mechanism. I'm not under, trying to understand effects of interventions. I just want to know who is likely to experience what outcomes in what time frame so that I can condition uh, essentially the clinical advice that I'm providing to, to people that's more matched to their actual risks. And so that is in and of itself a kind of one of these kind of areas of research. And then finally, the third one is cause and effect. And that's where, of course, clinical trials come in. Uh, or we actually want to, we see a problem, we might understand what's going on, but we want to make some change in the world to treatment or whatever. Uh, and hopefully that's going to have a positive impact on outcomes and we're going to improve and make things better than how we found them. And that's what we're all here for at the end of the day. And so before speaking to a statistician, I think it's really important to get laser focused on which of these three things you're really interested in. And I think the place where we go wrong the most often uh, is that um, there's this kind of fourth category that, that I don't use because it, it doesn't really mean anything absent of these, you know, independent of these three categories. And that is this identifying risk factors. You know, oh, well, I, many conversations I've had people say, well, we just want to understand the risk factors. Well, are you, you, you do you want to understand the risk factors because you're trying to, you know, produce a clinical prediction tool or model. You're trying to make accurate enough predictions about the future to benefit decision-making. Or do you want to know risk factors because they say to you something maybe about cause and effect. And if that's the case, then you have to really go beyond uh, either one of those directions. You have to go beyond just putting things into a model, selecting the significant findings and, and coefficients and reporting those. You really haven't done very much if that's where it all stops. And so asking a question like this, or rather being prepared to answer this question before you talk to a statistician, can really you know, be a nice shortcut um, to having productive conversations. Okay, so also, so along these lines is the next conversation that happens a lot between statisticians and clinician investigators, uh, and probably the most common one uh, is the sample size. And, you know, so what sample size do we need? This is the email I get, you know, this is what we're doing. Uh, 
And the reality is I call the sample size theater. We call it a calculation. It's never a calculation. The way most trials run um, is that the sample size is fixed in advance of even starting the trial. And we're doing, you know, there's a lot of advances in terms of adaptive trial designs and things like that, where it's not the case, but this is still, most trials are going to be fixed in design. You set the sample size at the beginning of the study, but you need to acknowledge that the inputs to that sample size, where you wind up at in the sample size evaluation, they can't be known with perfect accuracy. So at, at best, the sample size is an educated guess. Now, this is an argument for why we should do more adaptive trials, um, and but you need the infrastructure to do that and all the rest of it and the statistical expertise. But what you can do um, to come in and, and talk about a sample size with a statistician is you need to know as a clinician, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that evaluation that is purely clinical in nature and that the statistician really isn't going to have, they might have an opinion on if they've worked in that area for a very long time, which is great. Um, but these are things you need to answer. And so the starting point really is how many patients could you possibly hope to recruit? And in a perfect world, what would happen is, you know, you would come to the statistician, you would work together, and you'd come to the end of this process and you'd say, this is how many patients we need uh, to do this, uh, to reach this objective, to detect this effect. The reality is that we often wind up working this backwards. And the starting place is how many could you possibly hope to recruit? And then the statistician can often say, well, if you have that many, then this is what we can detect under these conditions. Is that enough? And that can be a very, very useful conversation. So understanding the numbers before you even have the conversation uh, is really useful and important. And it can tell you very quickly too, like if you have enough where you are or whether you need to extend to multi-center or whatever to start to find other collaborators, working that out as soon as possible is often very helpful. The other thing, another thing is that you need to tell us often what outcome measures matter the most. So a clinical trial is a device for, you know, estimating effects of things, causal effects of things. And, and causal effects always have to be stated in terms of some outcome, you know, so one intervention can in fact uh, affect many things about a person, which one of those things matter the most. And so it could be that it's survival, it could be that it's some quality of life measurement, blood pressure, whatever, but you need to say with your clinician uh, experience and also your understanding of what your peers think and what patients think are the most important things. That's something you need to come prepared to talk about with the statistician. We can't tell this to you. Um, now, there are some outcomes that are better than others from a statistical point of view, but again, the clinical importance has to come first and it has to come from you. Um, once you understand what those outcomes are, then it really helps the statistician if you can do the research to say what they tend to look like in the types of patients that you're going to enroll into your trial. And so if you understand what the mortality rate is in your patient cohort that you're interested in, if you understand what the mean and variance of the distribution of quality of life scores tends to be in the patients you expect to enroll in your trial, that information is really vitally important for the statistician in order to kind of balance signal against noise and give you an answer to at the end about what your sample size evaluation would be. And then finally, the other thing that, again, the clinician has to say, not the statistician, is how big of a treatment effect with respect to that most important outcome or a few small number of important outcomes, how big would it have to be to convince your colleagues to change practice? And so for thinking about clinical trials, I think of them more than anything else as a behavior change tool. Right. There's what people are doing in their day to day. There's what the, the you know, the, 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 the practice that you do today. Um, people don't just change how they do things willy nilly and we don't want them to and certainly not uh, clinicians. And so you need to, to think about, well, what would be worth evidencing? It, it, it could be that, uh, you know, you might think that this effect of this treatment is going to be a very marginal improvement on what we already do. Well, marginal improvements still sound good. But if it's not enough to convince other people, your peers, to change their practice, then what's the point? And so you need to think again about what that, what we call a minimally clinically important effect size would be. Uh, and that's really the thing then that you're designing the trial to reliably detect with the statistician. Um, you do need to make sure that you're educating yourself. Um, obviously, you will have had some training 
uh, in medical school and you might have had some follow-up training. And there are some clinicians that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that they become better statisticians than I certainly am. Uh, and there's everything in between. But if you're going to be involved in trials and you're going to be involved as a clinician scientist, then the statistics isn't just you know some add-on part to that. It's fundamental to the whole thing. And so while it's ideal to work with a statistician who spends the entirety of their kind of professional life thinking about statistics, trial design, and the rest of it, um, it really helps if you also engage. And one of the best places to do this is essentially with the kind of regulatory guidance around clinical trials. And sometimes I think that people think that these are documents written for statisticians. They're not, I don't think they really are. They're, stati they're, they're documents written for trialists. There's, you know, there's very little kind of math and equations and things like that. Not that we should be scared of math and equations, but these are documents that, you know, I think most clinical trialists, once they actually read them, uh, we'll find if they if they never have before, we'll find that they're actually quite accessible and they make they focus on kind of key issues and main points and all the rest of it. So if it's not stuff that you've engaged with before, you know, going to to ICH and looking at the regulatory stuff and guidance around statistics and data management and all the rest of it can be really, really eye opening. Um, and of course, there's lots of other things you could be reading and, and looking at and doing. Um, I like the James Lynn Library. If you're a little bit of a history buff, you can go and read about history of randomized evaluations. I find myself learning stuff from that all the time. Um, and it's a little bit, you know, kind of not the usual kind of dry study design stuff. Um, you know, find textbooks that work for you. Uh, when I moved into working in clinical trials, uh, one, of the, one of the books I used and found the most valuable was this one from Stephen Sin, which is Statistical Issues in Drug Development. Um, it doesn't have to be drug trials. The, the stuff that's in there uh, is about trials in general and could be widely applied. Um, but it is on you in some respects to continue to educate yourself. And if you're working with a statistician long term, then it's very likely that statistician will be happy uh, to have conversations with the things you're reading about and talk to them. Believe it or not, we like talking about this stuff, uh, especially with people that don't know as much as we do because it makes us feel superior and wonderful. So. Um, and then I'd spend a fair bit of time on, on Twitter talking about it. And I've learned an inordinate amount from other statisticians, particularly when I wasn't working in trials, but also clinicians and investigators who talk about the nitty gritty of the specific trials they've been involved in. Um, you know, trials in cardiology are different from trials in psychiatry are different from trials in cancer. And so being able to kind of see uh, people talk about their own research, I, I think is really valuable. Uh, and so maybe that's worth considering. Uh, and then, of course, there's blogs and lots of other stuff. Um, one of my favorites is this discussion board. Uh, this is kind of organized by a statistician named Frank Harrell. Uh, and then another trial statistician from the States, Andrew Alhaus, he made this very nice wiki uh, of common statistical myths um, that people publish all the time, but actually are uh, uh, not very useful or wrong, outright wrong. Uh, and so it's a, it's a set of references for, you know, things that people get wrong about statistics. All right, two more points, uh, and then I'll stop talking and very happy to take questions. Um, another thing that comes up is this issue of authorship. And so something I've had people tell me numerous times, um, which is a problem, is this, this idea, we can let you be an author. So, Darren, if you can get involved in our study, we can let you be an author. And I think the problem with this statement and why I would strongly encourage you never, ever, ever to let it uh, escape your your mouth is because authorship isn't yours to give uh, is the main point. So it reflects a misunderstanding, one of the kind of team element of what it takes to do research. It, it kind of undermines that respect for people's expertise and its importance for a clinical trial. Um, but we already have essentially rules and guidelines for who gets to be an author. And so if you've engaged with a statistician, they've worked with you, they've helped on the design, they've analyzed the data, they made decisions about how to do that analysis and report it, then clearly you should, they should be provided an opportunity, just like anybody else, um, to be involved in writing the paper and whatnot. Uh, and thus they should be an author. Now, you will have instances where a statistician might say, okay, well, I'll, I'll do this, but you know, essentially you've already designed it. I'm just going to do something so you can just acknowledge. Um, but typically, uh, that's a conversation uh, you know, to let them kind of lead. And, and it's, it's best to assume that if you're going to involve a statistician, they're going to be an author on your paper. Uh, and then finally, 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 uh, there's this tricky issue of kind of money. Uh, 
um, but still isn't very well resolved. So if you're working in environments where there is kind of core funded statistical support uh, for applied statisticians to work with in you know teams and and, and clinical trials, um, there can be these kind of awkward conversations still uh, about you know well I do need you know there'd be some resource that comes back to whoever is employing me to make sure that that organization uh, or, or institution continues to exist. And the problem there, though, is that statistics isn't a service that can really be sold as such, you know. And so my my unit uh, in Cork, we do both the data management and stewardship and a lot of open science and reproducibility stuff along with statistics analysis and design. And it's a lot easier to kind of badge and, and, and bundle the research management elements of the study as a service and to charge a kind of very clear uh, rates that are dependent on how much work effort, uh, software, and all the rest of it that's required for that particular study. You can't really sell statistics in the same way because it comes back to that point about the scientific integrity of the trial. You can't sell that. Um, so it can lead to some kind of uncomfortable conversations and whatnot. If if you are involved and, in, you know, you, you I invoice you for 10000 uh, and then you don't get the p-value you wanted or whatever, you know, it can be very awkward. Uh, so it's just to flag that up that it's, I promise you, it's an awkward conversation almost always for the statistician as well. Uh, we don't tend to be natural marketers and we're not trying to get into your pocket. Uh, it's just an acknowledgement that expertise requires resources and resources require resources. Um, okay, so I think I will stop talking. I think I've got time for 15 minutes for questions or whatever, which I'm very happy. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Darren. That was that was great. And yeah, we've all made statistical blunders before. It's very easily done. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Darren? I'm thinking, oh my word, I don't want to use a stats package ever in case I get it wrong. Any questions at all? Please either raise your hand or pop them in the chat. Hey. Don't be scared. Yes, Anili. Sorry, just um, just to summarise it. So, are we saying that if you want to start a research project, that from the very beginning you find, I'm just being very practical here, you just try and find a statistician that you can work with, and then you plan together. Yep, it, it's it's it, yeah. it is the ideal situation if you can find a statistician from the outset. Um, but again, it comes back to that challenge. That's not always possible, uh, unfortunately. Um, and if it isn't, you know, then it's, you know, that you, you have to try to educate yourself as, as best you can. And again, you know, it, with the acknowledgement that the day is already very short, um, and you already have a lot of responsibilities and things that you need to account for. So unfortunately it's, it's, it's kind of very hard to give advice per se. Um, but in a perfect world, um, yes, if you can work with a, with a trial statistician, uh, or a statistician, if you're doing some other kind of clinical study. Uh, it is ideal, and and ultimately, if you can find that person, um, it will it will it will reap benefits. It will it will stop some things from happening that might have uh, yeah. you know some some mistakes. Um, it might make the trial more efficient, requiring recruitment of fewer patients into the study, making it more plausible. Um, there's lots of reasons uh, why that's a good idea. And do you find statisticians is it universities? Sorry if you said this already, but I might have missed it. Like, where do you start to find a statistician? So that's a fair point. And so the real place to start is to talk to the clinician investigators where you work and, and, and to work with them. So sometimes it, it would be a university and it might be someone working in a stats department who'd be interested in that particular thing. Although again, I don't think uh, that that can be steadily counted on. Um, sometimes you'll find consultancy, uh, again, often in academic uh, you know, universities. Mm -hmm. um, I know the NIHR has statistics groups within it uh, that you might reach out to. Um, and then there's, if you're doing clinical trials, it could be worth reaching out to your local uh, clinical trial unit and to see what kind of support is available that way. Okay, thank you. I think there's a question in the chat, Darren. Would you recommend any courses to start with? Uh, yeah, so like specific courses, I, I, I'm, so this is, you know, again, you might ask other kind of people where you work. Um, I'm a book person, uh, and so I, I, you know, I, courses I find very good for very advanced topics. Um, I think for general stuff, you know, I think it's mostly about uh, 
uh, getting into the, the literature and books. Now, one great place to start is that the BMJ, for many, many years, ran a statistics, uh, it's a series called Statistics Notes. Uh, and again, that was Doug Altman and Martin Bland. Um, and those are wonderful, wonderful papers. And you can find essentially lists of all of them online with all the links that are easy to find and access. And they're all maybe one, two, three page papers on kind of key issues in study design and statistics for medical research. And, and so if you were to start any place, you know, if a person, and again, you kind of have to play the long game, right? Your career is long. You're going to be doing this for a while. You're not going to become an expert statistician by any stretch of the imagination overnight. But if you were to read, honestly, one of those papers a week, which wouldn't take you 15 minutes to read it, and then really think about it for the rest of the week and follow up and have conversations, you know, in, in, in probably in two years time, you'd know more than 95% of people engaged in clinical research. And you probably know a lot more than a lot of statisticians. So that, that's where I would start. It's called Statistics Notes, I think. Uh, and that was, those were published in the BMJ. Great. Any other questions from anyone? Please feel free to type them in. I'm safe and willing to answer them. But I would certainly agree with you, Darren. It takes a very long time if you're trying to learn how to do it yourself. I'm um, learning how to do some quite complex genetic stuff in R at the moment, and it can take two or three hours to write one line of code when you're starting out. It's a nightmare. No, oh, and it, and for what it's worth, that doesn't change the. Uh... You know, it's it's I, I I spend a lot of my time if I'm in front of the computer analyzing data. Uh, there's a lot of Googling and a lot of Stack Overflow and 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 all the rest of it and, and a fair bit of, you know, asking people on Twitter help. Uh, how on earth did you do this? So that's you're you're in the right you're in the right place if that's if that's how you're doing it for sure. Hopefully that's very reassuring for everyone. OK, any other questions that anyone has? Is that a legacy hand or a new one, Anneli? It's a new one, sorry. Okay, Will, go. <laughs> it's just, it's, sorry, it's just sorry, the statistics notes. Is that for learning about the basic stats as well, statistics notes? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be statistics and study design for clinical research. And, and, and really, you know, study design and, and statistics are kind of the exact same thing. We, hmm. we design studies to service uh, essentially the needs of a statistical, uh, of, of statistical inference. You know, there's a reason why uh, we randomize and things like that and they have to do with the statistics so it's the same thing yeah. but yeah it's it's yeah. statistics and study design for clinical research is what those those bmj ones and they'd be widely applicable across different clinical areas for sure okay there's another question are there any online tutorials that you would recommend yeah i so i wouldn't be the person to ask about that um i i, I do think one of the issues we have is that there is a a flood of online material uh, largely gets badged as data science. Um, and I think that you know, the quality of that can be very difficult to understand, whether it's good quality, high quality, or whatnot. Um, I think you definitely want, when you do find stuff, um, it's great if you can find stuff that's focused on the clinical environment. One of the things I think that people outside of clinical research, but who are interested in randomized controlled trials more generally, uh, which are used in business and banking and every other application, um, you know, that they don't understand the challenges and the constraints about running randomized controlled trials and experiments within a working, you know, healthcare system uh, or, or, or clinic or whatever. Um, so that, that's stuff that can be avoided. Um, try to find stuff that's focused on clinician stuff. I, I see a, a chat there about um, our training um, again, there's a wealth of R material, and for myself, we do a lot of teaching in R. Um, the place I almost always start actually is uh, with, with R Studio. Uh, they have a set of, um, oh, I'm trying to think of what they call them now. It's very easy to find if you go to R Studio and you look at, essentially, they'll have a training tab at the top of that web page. Um, and there's a lot of really excellent, very introductory training material there and, and a lot of good resources to build from. Um, is a good place. And then another question. So if anybody wants to get in touch with me, uh, really the best way to do it is actually on Twitter uh, it, it, because we discuss trials all the time and it's nice if there are questions sometimes, uh, you know, even if you want to do it anonymously, you can send me a DM and, 
we could put it into the main uh, timeline there and people can talk about the issues. And, and more importantly, you'll get way more than just my, uh, you know, my take on things. You'll get other people more experience and, you know, more varied experience and, and all the rest of it. So. Okay, so thank you very, very much, Darren. Hopefully that was a really clear introduction for you as to the, the, the trials and tribulations of running a clinical trial. And yeah, definitely get the statistician involved early if you ask them to sort it out when your paper's been rejected by a journal. Yeah, there's very little that the statistician's going to be able to do to salvage your project at that late stage. So yeah, talk to your statistician early and certainly be aware of the issues involved because then you can design in many solutions. So great. Um, there's well one put. last comment in the chat, Darren. Um, what do people do if they want to get hold of you and they don't use Twitter? Oh, sorry. I'll just, I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you. Fantastic. That's really helpful. And um, yeah, um, I certainly learned things listening to you and I've been doing stats for a while. So that's great. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Um, so our next